suddenly. Okay, I guess we're set to go now. Yeah. Yeah, welcome back, everyone. Today we will uh, start the text with, a, with at least the headline, which is uh, Namo Lokeshwarya. I pay homage to compassion. I pay homage to Shenrizik, to Avalokiteshvara, to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, so. And right from the beginning, let's, let's really appreciate that we come together in the spirit of compassion, of uh, kindness, of friendliness, of nonviolence. In particular, nonviolence towards yourself, towards who you are, towards your feelings. This is such an important aspect of our practice, of the Bodhisattva practice, is to find a place of peace with yourself, find a place of love with yourself. And that's also what this uh, title means, that homage. Yeah? So we are also paying homage in the beginning of this text to our own capacity, to our own goodness, to our own Buddha nature. And because in a way you can see bodhicitta or compassion as something you develop in compassionate training. But uh, in this text, uh, the attitude is rather that uh, compassion or bodhicitta is something which we discover, something which is already part of our nature, and something which is waiting. It's a treasure which longs to be found. So your goodness is a treasure which longs to be found. And you are the only one who can find it. So Namo Lokeshwarya, Namo Avalokiteshwarya, homage to Shenrezik, homage to His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Lama Sopa. But actually, in its uh, deepest meaning, uh, taking refuge or paying homage to the Lama is confirming your own awake awareness. Uh, sitting down, Uh, with the confidence, with the confidence of the Bodhisattva that awake awareness is already present. And that our practice is not about getting awake awareness, it is about removing the obstacles, healing the obstacles removing the clouds which stir up because of confusion, because of the dualistic, the dualistic split between me and the others. So it's easy in a text or in a prayer to kind of just read um, and kind of then go to the next sentence, but uh, this is definitely a sentence, a proclamation, just worth to pause and to feel into. To make it an experience. And um, 
sometimes this kind of experience of surrender of devotion of deep devotion is quite difficult for us because we are we are growing up in a culture where or you have a psychological history where sadly you learned or something in you learned that you can't trust anything or anyone because the people you have trusted in your life also as child let you down let you down um, so it is quite a journey uh, for us i think to really wholeheartedly with our whole body to uh, surrender uh, to compassion to Alakuteshvara, to Shenrezig. While we are doing it, you know, please remember always what you take refuge into, what you surrender into, what you pay homage to is your own true nature. That's why Buddhist refuge is a safe refuge because you take refuge into your own reality not uh, the reality of the mini-me, not the relative, uh, reality of the narrative self, uh, but a, a deeper reality. That's what you take refuge into. That's what you trust. So let's uh, start with a bit of uh, sitting quietly with what I said. So you take the seat and even if you are kind of experienced meditator, always you know, take that bit of time to come to the posture, feel into the posture with a curiosity so that your meditation posture remains to be a living process, not like a soldier's statue but a living process every day different every, every day it's a different experience within your body and your posture and then that's together uh, let's together as a we you know, as a group as a sangha uh, take our seat in the temple in the Mahayana temple of His Holiness and Lama Sopa Rinpoche, the Buddha, Tara, Shinrizik. Yeah, and then welcoming as best as you can. Arriving at your own door and welcoming yourself as a friend as best as you can. And uh, it is helpful to bring the breath somewhat into the foreground. Not, not concentration, but just the appreciation of breath, of life. And breathing, I'm alive. And allow yourself to, to breathe a little deeper than usual. Uh, not with effort, but just a little deeper, really feeling into the in-breath, appreciating the nurturing life-giving 
quality of the in-breath. And notice the whole body breathing. And breathing together, you know, breathing together here as a Sangha, but also breathing together with all the Bodhisattva babies, just like us, not only in the Buddhist tradition, who are breathing us with us, uh, who are breathing with us right now, but also breathing together with the uh, full fledged Bodhisattvas. Lama Sopa, His Holiness, and so on. Breathing together with all of them. And then following the out breath into space and having the possibility to release a little. In the belly and the shoulders as if you Put down a burden. I'm putting down the burden of the what about me thought. And possibly softening in the belly, in the shoulders, in the face, so that your energy can flow. And notice that the earth, the surface you're sitting on is carrying you. And let yourself be carried. And the narrative level of the me, the inner dialogue that's going on. But uh, as best as you can, try to stay relaxed with it, not getting involved. Just let it come and go like clouds, like waves. And you make a shift from the usual conceptual dualistic way of living, living in a world of projections and stories and labeling to a little bit more direct present moment awareness. I'm touching that mystery of life, which reveals itself if you let go of words, of meaning. So I'm breathing, I'm alive. And then to strengthen the sense of loving kindness, of compassion, of warmth, we invite Lama Sopa and His Holiness, the Buddha, Shinrizik again. And uh, you can't force it, of course, but See if you can 
soften a bit into an experience of their presence. So you smell them, there's a scent of loving kindness, maybe like roses in the air. There's a warmth, like sitting in the morning sun and just bathing. There's light. But also maybe there's a touch at your forehead, at your shoulder. So you gently open uh, to the experience of the presence of the awakened ones. So probably you are also aware of uh, those patterns or those aspects, those experiences within you, which prevent you to be in peace, which prevent you to be in love right now. So you're just also aware of them. And being curious about that. So what is it what prevents you to be in love, in peace, in compassion right now? And what happens if you identify less with that? What happens if you identify less with the tiredness or the nervousness or the boredom or the confusion or the I am not good enough? So what happens if you identify less with that? And again, make a movement with your awareness into the presence of the awakened ones and the presence of your own Buddha nature. And then you rest. Allow yourself to find a place of rest. And could you allow yourself to find a place of rest? Just in the present moment. Could you allow yourself to find a place of rest? just here with us. So there is some um, sensations and thoughts, sounds, feelings. When you hear my voice, maybe you hear also some of my surroundings here, the birds. And then there's the sounds in your immediate environment. feelings in the body, the breath. 
Some of it is pleasant, some of it is unpleasant, maybe the unpleasant or the pleasant is stronger. And we are inspired by the possibility to rest uh, as loving awareness in the midst of all of this. Neither indulging nor suppressing. Open, loving equanimity. So if you gravitate towards allowing this moment to be what it is, allowing yourself, being 100% loyal to what you feel, what you are, what you hear, what you think, So with that radical acceptance, a deep yes to the present moment. And there might be the possibility that a stillness reveals itself, a peace reveals itself. So that stillness, that peace, that silence has nothing to do with being calm or nothing happening. It's something deeper. So if you are able to a certain extent to allow this moment to be what it is, Is there peace here? And even if it's just a split of a second, even if it's just a glimpse, is there peace here? Is there silence here, stillness? And then rest, just rest. So is there peace here, surrounding, pervading your experience? So this is a bit similar to pointing to the sky on a cloudy day. So is the, is the sky here? So you look up. 
Yes, and sometimes the clouds break and you get a glimpse of the sky. Okay, so then let's slide out of this, uh, not um, leaving the seat, but um, just if you have your eyes closed, you open them, maybe you want to shift your position a little, but see if you can stay connected with the uh, sense of aliveness in your body, your presence, and also the sense of uh, sacredness in our virtual gompa. And a sense of uh, connectedness as uh, fellow travelers. So this um, pointing to stillness, peace, natural peace, silence, uh, that will be uh, one of the important exploration in this text. So pointing to that mystery of um, the possibility to have glimpses or tastes or moments of recognition of uh, Rigpa or the nature of your mind. Or, um, and uh, here through a kind of different route, not the study route and understanding route, but a more poetic, intuitive uh, kind of breakthrough, uh, which then needs to be stabilized and which needs to be supported also by our study. So let's uh, start the text. It starts with the invocation. And I already talked about this. So if you have any comments or question, you can uh, just write on the chat or interrupt me. I, I think I will also remember to give some time for questions, but uh, we are not so many, so. And uh, I don't have a plan that I need to cover something, um, so. I think we have planned some meetings, but um, if I if we don't finish this text, then I just continue as long as it takes. <laughs> so. so Namo Lokeshwarya. So Lokeshwarya is short for Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of compassion, and Namo is are paying homage or taking refuge to. Yeah? So it's really that 
proclamation of awe, which is really wonderful to have in the beginning of your practice. No, like um, an experience of awe, like, wow, how the heck did I, how, how the heck was I so fortunate in this life to come to this space? Yeah. How fortunate am I that I hear the words bodhicitta or compassion or goodness? Yeah. How fortunate is so His Holiness the Dalai Lama is seen as an embodiment of Lokiteshvarya, of Avalokiteshvarya. So it is always uh, really so supportive uh, if if you take that moment of really getting into namo lokateshvara i pay homage to compassion so that also means that you you take compassion first you put compassion first in your life so what is uh, what is in in the center of the mandala of your life so the symbol of the mandala where you symbolic representation of your life and your relationships including the past and the present and the future and what is in the center there and for many people in the center of the mandala of their life is career fame you know, being successful entertainment um, and so on. And uh, here uh, with this text, uh, we put into the center of the mandala of our life compassion, love, nonviolence. And of course, that's an ideal, yeah? So uh, again, we have to, we have to embrace and be with uh, the the conditioning which prevents us to be really there so these ideals they they are the direction the safe direction which we are inspiring us, us again and again to go towards but also an ideal ideal is helpful because it points you to the places within you where you're still stuck, where there's still forgiveness needed and healing and letting go, where there's still more wisdom needed. And uh, failing on the Bodhisattva path again and again is a very precious thing because it makes us humble. And so if you really uh, fail consciously and kindly, it then it increases your tolerance towards the failing of other people. So you become aware how difficult it is to go beyond the identification with the narrative self. It's so difficult to sing another to sing another th- song in your life. Uh, so so far we mainly have been singing "What about me? What about me? What about me?" And everyone else is singing that song. That's why we destroy this planet. And uh, as a bodhisattva, you familiarize yourself with how can I help? How can I help? How can I help myself and everyone else who turns up in my life?
So uh, Ken McLeod in his commentary, he as always, he tries to invite us into an experience of, um, so this Namolukvishvarya, in this case uh, was written uh, hundreds of years ago uh, by Thomas Sampo. And you know, we can really feel and assume that when he wrote his, this down, his hair stands on end and he has tears in his eyes. So this is not like just, okay, I have to make some holy title to this text and this is how I do it in the Tibetan, uh, um, uh, in, the, in, in my tradition. Uh, so uh, I don't think it is like that. So I think this uh, Namaluk Deshwara are written by the blood and sweat and struggle and suffering of another human being. Uh, proclaiming this in awe, but also maybe in a longing, in a yearning, yeah? Maybe when he wrote this, uh, he had, uh, he, he was in darkness, yeah? who knows when he wrote it. Or this proclamation, Namalakitishvara can, can happen in our life in different, uh, you know, in different qualities. Yeah? So, Ken McLeod invites us into an experience of this, and uh, here he starts with uh, the experience of the quietness or the silence, uh, which is part of this text. So the, the text is, obviously transmitting also on the condition level through images and through, and actually we also learn some things, you know, like the practice of Tonglen and, and stuff like that. You know, but there is, a, there is a bit of a deeper level in this text, you know, transmitting also the stillness, the silence, the peace, transmitting the experience of emptiness. Imagine that you are Lokeshwarya. So imagine that you are. So this is, you know, tantric practice, taking the result of the path into the path, uh, getting there by being there, starting at the end. Yeah? Not, not starting at the beginning, but starting at the end. And uh, imagine yourself as a, as a, as Chinarizik, as Avadukteshwara, as a Buddha of compassion, as a, as a goddess, if that is easier for you. Yeah? So as Tara, it's all the same. I mean, it's just different names. Yeah? So how, how does it feel to embody Tara? How does it feel? So the, the, yeah? how does it feel? Inside you are as quiet as a pond that lies in the center of a deep forest. So quietness, inside you are quiet. As a pond that lies in the center of a deep forest. You see, the, 
some people who read something like that, it doesn't mean anything, yeah? It's just, so, and, and that's fine, you know? That, that luckily, we have all the different approaches and doors within the uh, Tibetan tradition to, uh, to practice Dharma. But for some people, like an image like that, a poetic image, does something. And, 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 and so as quiet as a pond that lies in the center of a deep forest. Some people, you know, by, by uh, opening to an image like that, also by, when I read this, I connect with that experience myself. So that's also part of, you know, being read a poem. It's not, you know, I'm just not, I'm not sitting here as a head, uh, disconnected from a body, disconnected from my feelings, and I'm just reading some words to get over it. Yeah. So, uh, so sometimes it's possible for, for us with an image like that, with, with a poem like that, you know, to have an experience of that uh, quietness, more so if you if you would try to do a shamatha practice. Yeah. So it's one of the possibilities to find find some calm, to find some peace. So you imagine and you feel how it is to embody Tara. And inside you are quiet as a pond that lies in the center of a deep forest. A pond that protected by the trees around it has been undisturbed by even the slightest breeze for a thousand years. Feel that stillness within you. Feel that, feel that glimpse. Yeah? And if you don't uh, feel any stillness, you know, how would it feel if you would feel that stillness? Because of that stillness, you hear everything. Because of that stillness, you hear everything. You hear the cry of a baby when it first comes into the world. You hear a young, a young woman's gap of disbelief and despair when her boyfriend breaks things off. You hear the sobs of a pain of a woman stricken by breast cancer. You hear the sigh of a man when he first realizes that his body is losing its vitality. That's me. And you hear the rasping breath of those whose time in the world has come to an end. You hear the suffering of the world. So he goes on. Yeah? So you, you, you hear the suffering of this world. So here is so important to feel how it is to embody Shenrezig, 
Tara. And to feel, to experience the stillness, the mystery of stillness, the mystery of peace. And then to experience that within that stillness, within that peace, there's no boundaries. There's no center. There's no I here, no me here. There's no separation. In the stillness of your heart, in the stillness, your heart breaks and outpours a river of compassion. Your heart breaks and outpours a river of compassion. Maybe you are familiar with the iconography of uh, 1000 arms and raising and the that uh, image of the 1,000 arms and the 10 heads is actually symbolizing that your heart breaks, yeah? your heart explodes and outpours a river of compassion. You reach out and touch the pain of each and every person. Whatever the connection, you find a way to ease their pain. In that easing, each person knows a moment of open stillness, a quiet they have never experienced before, and that moment changes everything. So Namo Alokeshwarya, Namo Avalokteshwarya, Namo Shenrezik. I pay homage to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, to Lama Sopa, to compassion, to compassion. I pay homage to compassion, to kindness. And In that moment when you pay homage, when you read this, to take some time to shift into the embodiment, how would it feel to embody, to be Tara? And allow Tara's or Shenrezik's gaze the loving gaze, which also recognizes the dreamlike empty nature of everything, to pour through your eyes, through your mouth, through your hands. Yeah, is there anything you would like to say or ask? Also uh, from yesterday. So let's uh, start the text now. So that was the title. And uh, I, yeah, we could have stayed a year here. <laughs> um, but but the, the way in the Tibetan tradition is more that you return. Right? Like, okay, you move on, but then you return again. And so start. Start with this. this is very important. So even if you are even after 20 years, one has always to return to the uh, fundamental uh, pointers and fundamental teachings. 
So the text, one can divide the text in different ways, but one way is to see those. So there's the two stanzas in the beginning, uh, kind of the introduction, uh, which is the homage and another, other, another traditional way to how the Tibetans start a text. It's called the promise to compose. So these are the first two. And then uh, Tom Sampo goes into uh, 10, nine or 10 stanzas around the Lam Rim, where uh, those of you who have studied the gradual path of awakening within the Guluk tradition will recognize some of the topics uh, of the Lam Rim. And then uh, there is uh, the practice of Tonglen after that, which is one of the main practices uh, being taught in this text. So we will look into that. And then Tong, Mo, Tong Me Sampo goes into the Lojong teachings and the mind transformation teachings. So this is a, a sequence of the text where he uh, just comes up with all the situations which still after so many hundreds of years still uh, push our buttons and trigger us and bring us into reactivity. And then he suggests how as a Bodhisattva baby, we can uh, train ourselves to respond to these triggers in a different way. And then comes the section on the six perfections, you know, the practice, six practices of a Bodhisattva. And then in the end, there's some extra advice so that's kind of the, the overview of the text mm -hmm. and uh, the introduction, the first two, uh, the first two stanzas starts with a homage. You who see that experience has no coming or going. Yeah. You who see that experience has no coming or going. So this is um, it, it, this is really inspiring, uh, and uh, yeah, interesting that Tong Me Sampo starts with a teaching on emptiness, because what what is what he is pointing to here, you know, before he uh, and before he goes um, more deeply into. Bodhicitta and compassion and all the other things. Uh, the first thing he reminds of us uh, in this text is uh, the teachings on emptiness. You who see that experience has no coming and going, that's again Avalokiteshvara. Yeah? So Avalokiteshvara is, is uh, an archetypical um, um, uh, in an image of uh, compassion, but not a confused compassion, uh, in a, in compassion which is unified with emptiness, with, with wisdom, yeah? So recognizing the dreamlike nature of yourself and others and the world and compassion at the same time. So that's this you who see, yeah, so the you here is Avalokiteshvara, Shen Rizik. That experience has no coming or going. So instead of uh, now uh, going into, into kind of the more philosophical meaning of this uh, text, uh, of this sentence. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, to lead a bit, uh, to lead a, a meditation uh, using uh, the commentary of uh, Ken McLeod, uh, who in his commentaries, in his commentary here tries to kind of invite us into a taste of this experience not into intellectual understanding of the sentence, but a taste of this experience. So I invite you to take your seat for a few minutes. We're not going to do it a long time.
and uh, take a few minutes to a few moments to reconnect with the body and the breath. Mm. With the out breath again, softening and opening. And let your thoughts become less important. Don't emphasize the inner dialogue, but gravitate towards present moment of awareness, the spacious aliveness of this moment. In the temple, in the Mayana temple, protected by the Soul in the Dalai Lama and Lama Sopa, in the spirit of bodhicitta and compassion. And taking your seat. So and then uh, imagine that you're looking at a tree. So imagine looking at a tree. It's a windy day. You feel the gusts against your cheeks. So you feel the gusts, you feel the wind, you feel the earth. There's a scent. And you're looking at a tree. You hear the rustle of the leaves. So you hear, you feel, you smell have a sense of the presence of that tree, you look at it. Even the biggest branches sway in the wind. You see the branches sway, you hear the wind in the leaves, But there is no movement, not inside, not outside, not anywhere. So there is stillness in the movement, silence in the sound. Isn't there also presence? Isn't there also space? Now imagine that you could experience your thoughts and feelings the same way. So you let go of that image. And imagine you could experience your thoughts and feelings the same way right now. They come and go, but for, for you there's no movement, none at all.
It doesn't matter what arises. You experience it all, yet there's no disturbance in you, no movement whatsoever, no coming or going. So imagine, experience this moment like this in an openness and in a vastness. It's like the sky. And thoughts, feelings, sounds are like these leaves moving. but you experience no movement at all. You rest uh, as space, as stillness, as silence. So it is from that silence, that inner stillness, from where essence love manifests. And that essence love is effortless. It responds to life without you having a plan. So it is that profound and indescribable stillness, the mystery, which reaches out to ease the pain of the world. Okay, so and then slide out, stay connected in your body. So in this uh, in this kind of uh, you know, guided meditation where you're invited into an experience through images, through poems, uh, you know, it's uh, it's really helpful to. Uh, rejoice or be happy about glimpses. Yeah? It's like it's moments. So we are not doing this to kind of maintain and have a an, uh, kind of Hollywood-like amazing opening heart uh, with some violence in the background or something like that. Uh, but uh, so we are appreciative to, uh, towards uh, modest and uh, uh, little shifts or 
ähm, ja, Glimpses, ja, so wie ich sage, Glimpse Practices. And also uh, when in this kind of meditation, what happens to you is that you mainly me, uh, meet the aspects within you or the conditionings within you, which uh, prevent you to experience uh, stillness. Then that is still a successful. Okay? Because uh, you, you um, you start to get to know the conditioning, the habits, the aspects of yourself, the parts of yourself, which sabotage uh, uh, being, being at peace right now. And this conditioning um, and this maybe wounded parts of you, uh, which prevent you to be at peace right now, uh, it's very precious when they uh, when they became available when you can see them when you can address them when you can change your relationship to them uh, so of course if you have an attitude uh, i talked about that yesterday to your meditation that the meditation is about feeling good and like in in the compassion meditation is about feeling compassion uh, uh, then, then you will have a very hard time with uh, not only with compassion meditation, but also with gratitude meditation and self-compassion uh, meditation. Because what these meditations often do is that they reveal to us that which sabotages the experience of gratitude, of peace, of stillness. And that is a success. It doesn't feel good, of course. Um, but it is um, it's something to rejoice about, something to be satisfied about. So you, you see that experience has no coming or going, yet pour your energy solely in helping beings. So in other words, you see everything is empty, yet. Yeah, yet you pure, you pour energy solely into the into helping beings. So now, one could, you know, explore what has been said here for years. Yeah, because this is like really the heart of the Mahayana tradition: emptiness and compassion. This is like the Prajna Paramita paradox being described here. The thing is, no study, no writing will solve that paradox for us. Yeah? It's really, uh, it's, a, it's a journey. And um, of course, we can talk about it and discuss and trying to find an answer on the conceptual level but uh, the answer to what is being said here is, is not given on the conceptual level, it's an experience. So by, by, uh, by, by working with these kind of instructions and these kind of sentences, you slowly grow into the answer, you become the answer. You pour your energy solely in helping beings. This is, I mean, one has to, you know, you have to take a breath and feel into what is being said here. Yeah. You pour your energy solely into helping beings. And uh, this is so, I mean, this is, you know, this is really the core, the, the treasure of humanity that we are as human beings be able to do that. And that, uh, that we see this uh, you know, around us, it's so amazing. 
this is really like uh, when I'm touched with this, I'm so happy that I'm part of the human family because we are so good. Yeah. I can be also in touch with other aspects of humanity, yeah. But but this, it's it amazes me always. Why why do people help each other? You know, why do people sacrifice their life for strangers? Why why is it when I have a car accident in Copenhagen that there is so much help and support and people saving me and trying to. Uh, not only just, uh, you know, really like sacrificing something, even sacrificing their lives. Uh, yeah, and then what comes also to mind when you read this is, uh, you know, just noticing Lama Sopa moving and doing and going through his day, seeing him, yeah, or his holiness the Dalai Lama. Because uh, we are so fortunate that we are, we can actually meet uh, people, human beings, let's see them as human beings. One of the ways to look at them, uh, who actually embody this. And I imagine, because you are here and somehow you are drawn to uh, the Bodhisattva path and the teachings on compassion within the Tibetan tradition, I, I imagine that you have been, maybe even from childhood, you have been in contact with that soft spot in, in your heart, a knowingness that you are born to serve. You are born to make a difference. You are born to, to heal. You're born to contribute. And then of course, you know, life happens and you know, we lose a bit of a connection with that and we need to revive it. But there is that um, in the Mayana tradition, it's called the Mahayana seed or the Bodhisattva seed. Uh, there, it, there is that. And, it's calling us to this crazy project of sa saving everyone. Also, they don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> so this crazy project of saving all beings, uh, which are unfindable. That's why we save them. And that's why we can save them. Yeah? So that's the Prajnaparamita paradox being expressed here in the first two verses. And uh, what is very important for us at the level where we practice and to pour your energy solely into helping beings has to start with yourself. So many of us, we are, and we didn't choose that, it's something it's because something happened to us. You know, so, you know, if you, you could say uh, it's our karmic background. Uh, but um, uh, so one of the most important parts of our Bodhisattva practice is to heal that which is uh, hurt within us, that which is confused in us, that which is scared in us, and then uh, trusting your goodness that the pouring out will just happen effortlessly you don't need to push it you don't need to it's just what happens uh, the, the goodness in you the bodhicitta in you wants to shine it wants to come out uh, and it's not a it's not it, it's a it's a it's an honorable way of living uh, to to take the time to heal yourself so that the light can th shine through you and that's where you need to start
Yeah, my excellent teachers. Yeah, my excellent teachers. So that's uh, uh, appreciating the lineage. And when we when we read uh, something like that, so my excellent teachers, so uh, you know, Tong Le Sanpo writing this, his hair standing on end, and uh, his eyes full of tears. My excellent teachers, uh, uh, but also for us, it, we can uh, we can remind ourselves that we are participating here. When we enter this text, you know, as it, you know, this text is like a, this text is like a temple. It's it's a sacred space. You know, it's it's not just like reading a book. It's it's a, it's like a pure realm of a Buddha. Yeah, something like that. And um, and with that, with entering this space, we enter the lineage. A time-tested lineage, which goes back to Tongme Sangpo and then back to Atishur and back to Shanti Deva and then you know the centuries back to the Buddha and then into infinity. My excellent teachers and Lord All Seeing. So that's again Avalokiteshvara, Lord All Seeing. The ones, the one who sees everything with loving eyes, with a loving gaze, the Lord all seeing. I ever humbly honor with my body, speech, and mind. So my excellent teachers and Lord all seeing, I ever humbly honor with my body, speech, and mind. So that's the prostration of paying homage. So is there any anything coming up for you? Question or something? Yes. Um, Stefan, I'm so happy you said about the paradox, because that was my first thought when you said like, you know, try to hear the silence and the sound. I thought that's just not possible. Like, and I could hear your birds. And I thought, you know, it's just not possible. And I thought, but wait, you know, he's saying it's possible. So I should try to figure out how. I haven't figured out how, but I just thought, you know, on initially hearing it, it's just, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And the same with the stillness and the movement. It was just like, uh, you know, it's, I just can't do it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so one, uh, we, and we will return to this, yeah, and uh, uh, as long as it takes. <laughs> um, so this is a bit like, uh, so there's a cloudy day and, you know, you look at the clouds, the movement, and then someone points to the sky and says, oh, look, the sky. And so then you see, yes, there is the content, that, which the clouds, which comes and goes, but there is also the sky. And I can kind of shift my, where I focus on or where I look, I can shift from the clouds into the sky. And even, if the sky, if the clouds don't break open, even by kind of knowing the sky is still there, we can still like have an experience of uh, spaciousness. The, another image would be um, 
uh, the ocean and the waves. So the waves come, so that's the sounds and the movements. And you become aware of the depths of the ocean, like the, the underlying stillness, the underlying peace from, from, from where the movement of the waves arises and dissolves back into. Uh, another moment where that sometimes that kind of natural peace or primordial stillness uh, beca reveals itself is when you sing, like when you sing mantra. And then there is the, it stops. And many people don't know that actually the important thing with mantra is the, the moment when it stops, when the mantra stops. Yeah. Uh, so, and then, then there is, so what is when, when something like that stops, when something is gone, you know, so gone. There is not nothing. Yeah, there is like a gap. It's called so it's also called sometimes the gap. Mind the gap. Yeah. So it's, a, it's also a pride, like mind the gap. There is something there. I mean, even now, like if this sentence is finished, there is a gap. Yeah. So but in that gap there is not nothing. Uh, but there's also no, uh, the, the movement or the words, they are not happening. So, it, yeah, it's um, maybe another uh, like situation from life experience would be if you go to a, like a concert, you know, like a classical concert maybe. And, uh, and it's really moving, like maybe kind of a, a Bach, you know, Bach concert or something like where the, which comes from, from the space of uh, spirituality or oneness. So, and then you, then you are in the concert hall and, you know, and there's this intense listening in the audience and it's like one of the best orchestras in the world. They have trained for this for 30 years and <laughs> Doing, they're doing their piece, and then it stops, and it's like, wow! It's like, yeah. It's like not a moment of non-duality. People don't call it that, but it's like you. You melt into the audience, you melt into the orchestra, you melt into the one who wrote that piece, and but it's still. Yeah. So, mm, you, you said I can't do it, and that's, absolutely right you can't do it because it's not a doing yeah you can't do it so this is not a, a practice no there's a lot of value in learning um, uh, shamatha practice your mind stages uh, so there, there there's a doing there yeah, so there's a doing there. So you get better at something. It's like a training and you have results. And, and that's very good. And that can actually help uh, to have on that, to have some training there. Um, but here is something else. Uh, this is, uh, so this is uh, pointing to something which you can't do. It's something, something to discover. But the problem is, that's something to discover can't be described in words. Also, I make words about, around it now. Uh, I, I, I use images like the sky and the clouds and, and so on and so on, or I tell the story about this orchestra. Um, but uh, it, 
all of that is not it. Uh, all of that is, is yeah. I'm, I'm happy that we will get back to this. Uh, uh, you know, um, because uh, having a taste, a glimpse, Just thinking about another word. I, I have a German word in my mind. It's called Ahnung, which is like um, it's like yeah. You you have a like you have a subtle sense of something. You, you know, so you, you don't, uh, you know, it's not like uh, that you, you are sure or you know, that it is like a describable experience, but you know, in your heart you feel, you feel that there is something, there, there, there is a silence, there's something bigger than this. And I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say about it, but, and, and I had been in touch with this maybe uh, uh, in my childhood and now I start to recognize it's it's like like a subtle smell which you are which where you want it. is it here is it not yes yeah, here yeah you know it's something like that yeah. but, but it, so uh, subtle experiences like this uh, can make really a big difference in our, in our life because we start to trust that um, the, the that this uh, that this peace that this stillness is available in any moment, and we start to trust that touching and coming in touch with that and shifting our sense of identity into that will then lead into. Uh, into uh, the Bodhisattva's life. Yes, okay. Yes, uh, there's one question, would you say it is like, Pointing to the ultimate within the relative. Yeah, I, that's um, that's um, I would say, and also for most of us, it is beneficial to uh, in the through the study of emptiness to have a bit of an intellectual understanding of what is pointed to. Uh, But there always has been this more intuitive sharing transmissions through singing, through art, through stories, through uh, through connection, through relationship, uh, through 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 the mystery of uh, being in a sangha and relating to a teacher. Uh, this also has its place. Yeah, so let's stop with uh, the dedication. I want to read it again, the one I read yesterday from Ken McLeod. So goodness comes from this practice now done. Yeah. Goodness comes from the practice now done. And here we can really rejoice in each other's presence, but also you know, the people who helped to make this happen. Yeah. So that's part of this goodness of this meeting. And 
also, of course, the presence of Lama Sopa and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Without them, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. And from all of that, a goodness arises. Let me not hold it just in me. Yeah. Let me not hold it just in me. So this is really uh, going beyond the hope that this practice will benefit me will make me feel better or make me more productive or more successful or more beautiful or more relaxed or more compassionate so that I can make more money. So uh, let me not hold it just in me. Let it spread to all that is known. And so let it spread to all that is known that also really makes sense when you dissolve the illusion of separation. Yeah? Let it spread to all that is known. It is possible because you're connected with everything else. Let, so let it spread and awaken good throughout the world. Yeah? Awaken good throughout the world. Thank you very much. See you next time, hopefully. And uh, get the book if you, I mean, only if this kind of writing speaks to you. you know? So if you are more like a Prasangika Madhyamika philosopher, then I wouldn't recommend the books uh, from Ken McLeod and also not the books from Pema Schoetren because they are not going to talk to you. Uh, uh, but if that kind of approach uh, uh, has some value for you, then uh, it's a small book. So, and it's something you know, to return to. Reflections on Silver River by Ken McLeod. And see you and thank you very much for your contribution and presence. Thank you, Stefan. It's really wonderful, very inspiring. So um, there is one question that somebody wants to know if it's possible to contact you directly if questions come up before our next class, which will be at the end of June, the weekend of June 26th. Um, yeah, um, you can write me uh, on Facebook or uh, if you, uh, there's an email address on my website, uh, it's Stefan Pendercom, my website, so you can take, you can contact me. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. This is really wonderful. Thank you.